the fall and expulsion of Eden. The Bible begins in Genesis with the origin of creation and culminates in the book of Revelation with the new creation. While the first book of the Bible tells the story of the fall and expulsion from Eden of our first parents, Revelation concludes with the definitive exclusion of the rebels from the heavenly city and the return of the redeemed to the new Eden. Both books, Genesis and Revelation, show us that the rebellious angels' methods of deception are essentially the same. First, he makes them believe that the wages of sin is not dead, but that they will continue to live without the need for redemption. And he aims to prove it in the end through spiritualism, using apparitions of the dead and covering the earth with the false miracles performed by the spirits of the demons. The second point in Satan's strategy for deceiving human beings is to make them believe that they can become more than God intended them to be. Before his fall, that exalted angel wanted to be like God. And he tried to awaken that same desire for self-exaltation in our first parents, making them believe that they could obtain higher knowledge at the expense of the divine design. Sadly, the Bible concludes in Revelation showing that on a global level, that pretension to graduate to a higher sphere ends in failure, degradation, and eternal ruin. What are we seeing today in the very apocalyptic epoch of the end? God created the earth for us to inhabit, but men want to migrate to Mars. God made man and his wife in his image and likeness, but men seek to honor women above themselves and even God, as they did anciently with the pagan goddesses Astarte, Isis, and do even today with Mary in apostate Christianity. And in modern times, men also deified a woman above God during the French Revolution, calling her reason as a symbol of a freedom from God. Even so, human beings are not happy. Unsatisfied with the many gifts God gave his stewards, the stewards of this creation, they want even more. They want to obtain supernatural powers that allow them to exalt themselves above everything and everyone. It is also that desire of women to occupy a position for which God did not call them that is corrupting society today. Let us read from the spirit of prophecy the following statement. Eve hath been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eve's, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. In their efforts to reach positions for which he has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. In their desire for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed them. There is always a danger of taking upon ourselves a work that the Lord has not placed in our hands and neglecting that which he has given us to do 
and which you would better honor his names. These are all statements of the spirit of prophecy. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. There is something that few pay attention to in the account of the fall. What the serpent told the woman about becoming like God if she disobeyed was true. The deception was that he did not tell her the whole truth. The serpent told Eve that if they ate the fruit of good and evil, they would be like God, knowing good and evil. They ate it, and God recognized that, indeed, Adam and Eve became like God in a point which God knew would not be good for them. Let us read Genesis 3, 22. The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Genesis 3, verse 22. Knowledge in the Hebrew language involved more than a theory. It was an experiential knowledge, as when the Bible says that Isaac knew his wife. What is God's knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve didn't experience until they disobeyed God? Independence. This was something that they had not experienced before, which was not good for them. Adam and Eve knew good because they had been created by God to be dependent. And in this condition, they lived in perfect harmony and happiness. But by disobedience, they became independent from God and began to a path that produces misery, pain, and death. The latter was not revealed by the devil to Eve. On the contrary, he masked it, saying only, you will not die. God can live without us, and that is not bad for him because he does not depend on us. He existed before he created us. But we cannot live without God because we have no life in ourselves. Just as the little ones God gives us as parents cannot live without us, so we too cannot become independent of God and live. Therefore, our independence from God sooner or later produces pain. And that knowledge that is disastrous for us touches even the heart of God who suffers from losing so many of his children. God experienced that pain already in heaven with the cry for independence of Lucifer and his angels because God is love. He knew good and evil, a knowledge that was not good for humanity. The Apostle Paul said that no one lives for himself, and in the postfall context, Neither does anyone die for himself. Romans 14, verses 7 and 8. This implies that we are all subject to a social order determined by God at creation. If we fulfill that order, we will live for God and to serve our neighbor. If we do not fulfill that order, we will die for God and others. There is a law to which we all have to submit in order to live and not corrupt than that divine order under penalty of death. Everything has a purpose in the universe. No one and nothing exists by itself except God. In the words of the Apostle Paul, God is 
the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, natural immortality. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. For from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Romans 11, 36. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1, 16. Do we want to be happy? Let us fulfill the purpose of our, our creation, which is to give glory to the one who created us and did everything for our good. Let us now turn to the next question. If subjection to the divine plan is for our good, in subordination toward God and independence from him is for our evil, does God know subjection or does he require it only from us? Yes, God also submits to his law. Otherwise, who could understand him? In the book of Genesis, we can see that the persons of the deity live, speak and act in common accord. Actually, God says there, let us make man in our image and likeness. According to the Jews today who deny the Trinity, God would be speaking in the story of creation with a plural of majesty. But considering both testaments of the Bible, there is more than a plural of majesty in these expressions. The Trinity is implied there. Jesus also showed how the Trinity acts in common accord, saying that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, John 16, verse 13. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you, John 14, 26. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works, John 14, verse 10. Thus, Jesus confirmed that no one can come from God claiming to possess a spirit that contradicts the divine witness. We see this already in the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah identified God and the Holy Spirit as two distinct persons who make up the Godhead. We read it in Isaiah 48, verse 16, where the prophet says, literally, the Lord Eternal has sent me and His Spirit. In addition to the Lord, there is His Spirit. In reference to the promised Messiah, Isaiah called Him Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Let us consider now the subjection of Adam and Eve. Subjection and dependence are good. They give us a sense of appurtenance and acceptance. God saw it well to share that good with Adam, which the Trinity possessed, by giving him a companion like him. For this reason, God said before creating Eve that it is not good for man to live alone, Genesis 2, 18. But once Eve broke her subjection to her husband and to God's word, she realized that what she thought to be good was evil. Today, the world seeks freedom because it lives badly, lives in sin, and the principle of submission under sin is often despotic. 
This is the reason why we want to become independent. But when we are converted to God, we discover that subjection to the Lord is good. Either we fall into the despotic domain of the devil or we surrender to the subjection of the Lord who is love. And on the same day that Adam and Eve decided to become independent from God, to be sovereign like God, they began to die just as God had warned them. Instead of living in perfect subjection and peace, they began to quarrel and blame each other. Adam ended up blaming even God for the woman God had given him and Eve blamed the serpent which deceived her. That's what the Genesis story tells us about the fall. Why is it so hard for humans to submit to the plan designed by God in Eden? Because the spirit introduced by sin remains and no one wants to live in submission or subjection. The woman does not hold on to their man, nor does the man want to tie himself to a woman. That's why there are so many divorces. And neither of them wants to submit to God either. But in Jesus' words, it was not so from the beginning, Matthew 19, verse 8. What was it like then when God created our first parents? Let us read the following statements of the spirit of prophecy. Adam was appointed by God to be monarch of the world under the supervision of the Creator. God gave Eve to Adam as a help meet. Another statement. The angels cautioned Eve not to separate from her husband in her employment, for she might be brought into contact with this fallen foe. If separated from each other, they would be in greater danger than if they were together. The strength and happiness of Adam and Eve would remain only in mutual dependence and subjection. And as a pattern of this mutual dependence was the Trinity. Indeed, God gave Adam a woman so that he could love a fellow human as the three persons of the Trinity love each other in the divine sphere. Just as the Trinity means the unity of three, the couple was also to become, become one flesh. Genesis 2, verses 22 to 24. Let us read. Adam, not Eve, was monarch in this beautiful domain. Until he and Eve decided to be free from God's supervision and became subject to the rebellious angel. Having conquered Adam, the monarch of the world, he, Satan, had gained the race as his subjects. Through deception, the devil promised them freedom, when in reality he made them slaves to selfishness and to his despotic dominion. Romans 6, verses 16 to 19, 2 Peter 2, 19. This is why rebellion is spreading today more than ever everywhere in the home, in the church, and in the nations. Let us now consider the course that we find uh, because of sin in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. Once sin came in and broke the order of, of our creation, God approached Adam first, for it was he to whom God had entrusted the woman and Eden. Because of his sin, death was to pass to all mankind, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. But the Lord comforted the first couple and told them that they could stay together if they respected the divine order of creation. 
That would be more difficult now because the spirit of insubordination had already been installed in them. Even so, when God commands, he trains and qualifies those who want to obey so that they can obey. Adam would continue to be the head of the family, although he had lost his principality over all mankind. That principality would be restored by the second Adam. We may read uh, uh, a description of this in Micah chapter 4, verse 8. But the original subjection that had been pleasurable to both man and woman since they were created would now often be painful. Even the earth and everything it produces would be affected. Outside of Eden, the earth was to produce thorns and thistles. Cultivation would require the sweat of the forehead. The serpent would harass them until the promised seed comes to give Satan the, cup, the grace of the head, on the head. And regarding the couple, there would be a mixture of blessing and curse with the new situation produced by sin, which required a more definite precision on the role of the woman regarding her husband. God said to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will lord over you. Genesis 3 verse 16. Here we see that the curse which fell on the couple had to do with a submission under containment and rivalry, not with a voluntary and happy submission as it had been at the beginning. But by redemption, every couple can approach the Edenic ideal of mutual dependence. That is the purpose of redemption, to restore the happiness that is obtained when one returns to the original subjection to God and neighbor within their particular social sphere. Does redemption change the order of divine creation that made man the head of his wife? No. And in human organizations, as in the church, there are also heads understood to be leaders to whom Christ confers his authority to the extent that they depend on the supreme head that is Christ. The order of authority begins in God, continues in Christ, then in the church and home. Every human being who wants to be a head must first know that he is under another head and to the extent that he submits to that higher head that is Christ, he will be in a position to exercise an acceptable leadership. The model of that divine authority is represented especially in the Christian home, which in turn constitutes a model for the leadership of the church. Let us read. The home is a school where all may learn how they are to act in the church. Another statement of the spirit of prophecy. Every Christian family is a church in itself. The father is the priest of the household, that is, the pastor, accountable to God for the influence that he exerts over every member of his family. Another statement. The father, as a priest, I would say as a pastor of the household, the mother, as a home missionary. Again, just because Jesus is our supreme head doesn't mean we can't have leaders who act as heads of the congregation. So it was in the Old Testament where we are told that God was literally the Rosh in Hebrew, the head of his people, as we can read it in second and the second book of Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 12, without implying that no heads, rush in Hebrew, or leaders could be permitted in the community. The spirit of prophecy also referred to church leaders as being at the head 
of our various institutions. Satan causes church members to engage in a spirit of criticism of denominational leadership at all levels. He excites jealousy and dissatisfaction toward those at the head of the work. Are we satisfied today with the current situation of society? On the one hand, there are abuses of power, and on the other, there, there is disagreement with the role that God assigned to every human being in this creation. Therefore, many do not want to submit to anything or anyone and still reject the sexual identity that God assigned to them nor do they want to submit to the social order that God established in Eden, which redemption seeks to re-establish in the bond of love. And to top it off, there are ecclesiastical authorities who want to take God's place in an illegitimate way, offering forgiveness of sins that only God can give. In extreme cases, we find people who live alone completely isolated because they believe that the world is bad and that the only solution is to chew bitterness in solitude. By living according to the flesh, they do not submit to God's law, nor can they. But thank God for his redemption because through him we can again depend on God in the bond of love. Subjection to God and our neighbor in the order established by God confers on us identity and belonging. We are not alone, not knowing where we come from and what we live for. We belong to God by creation and redemption and to the early and heavenly family, Ephesians 3, verse 15. Let us now consider redemption that is also found in the chapter of the fall. That redemption God promised to Adam and Eve, and through them to all their offspring. Happily, God did not expel Adam and Eve from Eden without showing them mercy. The wages of sin were hard. They had been exposed to God and the universe without anything covering them. But now God dressed them in full robes. A substitute animal had to be slaughtered to be clothed with its skin. Yes, the promised seed, the Lamb of God, would come in the future to redeem them and allow them to return to the garden again. What is the redemption of this creation? Let's say it again in other words. With the introduction of sin, this world was disbanded. Each one was turned to his own way, Isaiah 53, verse 6. But God collected in the servant of the Lord the sin of us all. Yes, in the person of his Son, God himself gave us a perfect example of submission and service to the will of his Father. He died as a lamb that submits to his shears and those who sacrifice it. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2, verse 8. The Father also did not prevent this from happening and hid his face from the pain. But all this was determined beforehand by the heavenly council and the entire trinity submitted to the plan of salvation. Christ came to subject the world again to God's authority. The apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him 
who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. What a greater surrender and subjection than that of the Son in eternally identifying himself with the redeemed race. This creation will thus have been saved eternally by being allowed to return to its pre fall condition. And not only this creation, but also the entire universe will have seen that the creature's submission to the Creator and the Redeemer is an expression of God's love. Everyone who submits to the one he loves submits himself by love. Let us conclude by repeating the description of what love is as defined by the Apostle Paul in the chapter of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let us submit our life to God's love. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your creation and for your redemption. Thank you for allowing us to know that we were not abandoned in our sins, in our fall, but you give us the promise to return to this wonderful home that you created at the beginning for us. Help us to fulfill the purpose of our creation, which is to glorify you as creator and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>